A golden moment for Kenya. The former British colony celebrates 50 years of independence and an African success story. But is Kenya now suffering from a midlife crisis, haunted by legacies from the past? This is Inside Story. And welcome to the program. I'm Sue Turton. Kenyans have been marking half a century of freedom from British colonial rule and reflecting on the country's emergence as a regional economic heavyweight. If 1963 was the dawn of a new era, then Kenya could now be seen as basking in the sunshine. But corruption and crime, inequality and the threat of ethnic unrest are still casting long shadows. For now, though, the mood has been one of celebration. Thousands turned out to enjoy Kenya's golden anniversary in the castle. Sarani Stadium in Nairobi. <laughs> President Uhuru Kenyatta addressed the crowd as his father Joma Kenyatta had done in 1963 when he became the first Kenyan to lead the East African nation. The freedom we enjoy today was earned by the blood of patriots and their sacrifices must never be in vain. As we recognize the important role that they played in our nation's history, we must remember that the greatest honor that we can give them is to live by the high ideals that they envisioned for Kenya. Their passionate dream for an equitable, free and just Kenya must be our driving force today and in the years to come. Most importantly, the unity exhibited by the freedom fighters regardless of their race, tribe, religion or class, should motivate our efforts to build a united, prosperous nation, divide of ethnic or parochial divisions. We must remain united as Kenyans, and I underscore that this is not a matter of choice. So, has the country lived up to the hope and excitement of 50 years ago? Peter Grester has this report for Inside Story from Nairobi. 50 years ago, Kenyans had only confidence in their future. At last, British colonial rule was over. They were to be led by one of their own, President Jomo Kenyatta. And the nation was free to choose its own destiny. In his Independence Day speech, President Kenyatta made a pledge that has since been ingrained in every school child's mind. The new government would, he said, eliminate three great scourges, poverty, ignorance and disease. Evans Kenyan Jury remembers the day well. He was working then, his new barber's business was just getting started, but he heard and believed in Kenyatta's promise. For the former independence fighter who'd been imprisoned and tortured by the colonial authorities, freedom meant everything and he carried his faith through the years he used to shave Kenyatta's successor, Daniel Arup Moy. But half a century on, the still impoverished veteran is disillusioned. I feel bad. I fought for independence, but I haven't seen any benefits. There's nothing that has helped me. I used to cut Moy's hair. I begged for land for us, and he refused, so we parted ways. At least there's been good progress in dealing with ignorance primary school education is now free and although the quality of teaching has suffered under the load, literacy has improved and universities are booming. But disease remains stubbornly persistent. Campaigners say there are plenty of promises to fix the struggling healthcare system but no clear way of meeting those commitments. Take a recent promise of free maternal care. Yes, the president comes out and says this but do we have really, you know, a policy from government uh, saying how this will work and to my knowledge there's no policy document. So we seem to have this gap between what politicians promise and what they actually deliver. Of course that's a common complaint the world over but in Kenya it's become so entrenched that the entire political system has become dysfunctional. People have been able to change uh, the, the, the personalities who they think are not delivering what they have not been able to do is to ensure that the succeeding people, the people who come after those, don't act like the other ones. So 
parliament after parliament, it has behaved the same even when people are changed. Back in his barber shop, Evans has given up any thoughts of retirement. The 82-year-old can't afford it. Kenya is a better place than it was, he says, but it isn't what he imagined. Peter Grester, Al Jazeera, Nairobi. So let's bring in our guests in Nairobi. Binya Vanga Wainaina, a Kenyan author and journalist and winner of the Kane Prize for African Writing. In Oxford in the UK is Stephen Howe, Senior Research Fellow in the History and Cultures of Colonialism at Bristol University. And joining us from the Kasarani Stadium in Nairobi, where the celebrations have been taking place, we have Boniface Mwangi, an award-winning Kenyan photojournalist who won praise for his images of the post-election violence of 2007 and 2008. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to start with Boniface Mwangi. What does this 50-year anniversary, this day of celebration, mean to, to your generation and to you? I don't think it means a lot to us because we are still unemployed. We have no jobs, we have no hopes. For a young man in this country, you're likely to end up dead or in jail before you get, a, get yourself a job or even join a militia. So the president today didn't offer anything new. Uh, he hasn't been offering anything, anything new to the young people, and we, we have lost hope, basically. So as we watch the president speak today, and we, we are still facing the same struggles we were facing 50 years ago, and what is actually much, much worse is that today we have the culture of impunity, uh, we have corruption, and we have tribalism. So on top of the poverty, ignorance, and disease, there are three more problems that we have to tackle. And the president, I don't think, is the right man to tackle that problem, because his father was the biggest land grabber in this country. We have thousands of Kenyans who are squatters because of what his father grabbed. So if the president himself doesn't have the, he doesn't even have the capacity to deal with the challenges that we've been facing for the last 50 years. That's reflecting on current situation. Binyavanga Wainai now, what about looking backwards to the whole question of colonialism? Do you think the current, your generation, the, the current generation really, it matters to them? Do you think they think about th th what happened back there? Or, or is that something that's kind of for the history books now? Um, I think it's always important to appreciate what came before, and, and I think that most African countries, Kenya included, uh, st struggle uh, to jump out of the straight jackets that those preset maps, administrations, and ideas brought to us, right? Um, and of course, the idea of what, you know, what we call neocolonialism, Ben Boniface has spoken about it quite, quite powerfully. Um, but you know we are we are we are in a place where we've come through quite a battle against very conservative and retrograde uh, elites to start to define how to stretch out of those constraints by a new constitution, uh, and so those those for me are the territories that are, are quite exciting that that. The, the, the country that I begin to see looking possible um, is breaking out of the habits of the constraints that the colonial place put. Uh, and in that process, we have a lot of chaos and a, lot, a, long, a long way to go. But it's an adventurous time. A long way to go, Stephen Howe. Uh, looking back to when foreign rule disintegrated in Kenya, how has the country developed since '63, and how much of an impact did foreign rule have on the development of Kenya? Well, of course, the very existence of Kenya as a state is a product of colonial rule, and within it, experiences both of the British Empire and of independence and development since have been extraordinarily diverse. You know, one can't give a single answer. It depends if one's rich or poor, male or female, urban or rural, and of course experiences have been very different for different regions and ethnic groups of the country. Overall, if one compares, say, with its neighbours, the other former British colonies in that part of Africa, Kenya's post-colonial experience looks overall pretty positive if you compare against the long nightmare into which once Uganda descended, though from which thankfully it's mostly recovered. If we compare against Tanzania, incredibly uneven. 
Tanzania on the whole has had a better experience in terms of creating national unity and political stability. But if we look at records of economic development, Tanzania has often been a depressing story, whereas Kenya has, again unevenly, experienced periods of quite a lot of growth. Meanwhile, of course, legacies of violence from the end of colonial rule and since still haunt so much of the country. Let's get onto the violence in a minute. I just want to crunch a few of the figures when we're talking about the comparisons. Uh, let's have a look at a quick snapshot of how Kenya has developed over the, the past 50 years. The nation is considered one of Africa's so-called lion economies. The International Monetary Fund expects Kenya's economy to grow by 5.9% by April 2014, accelerating to 6.3% through to 2015. The population boom has quadrupled the number of Kenyans since 1963. The population now stands at 43 million and it's a young country with 80 percent of Kenyans under the age of 35. Life expectancy is four years above the average for sub-Saharan Africa at 60 years old but that's the same as it was in the mid-1980s and mobile phone use is seen as a good indicator of African technological progress. Kenya leads the pack here with 71 mobile phone subscriptions for every 100 citizens. Well, statistics are one thing, perception possibly another. Cartoons are often seen as a, a good barometer of public opinion. This one appeared in Kenya's Daily Nation newspaper. It shows Kenya holding a list of challenges it faced in 1963, poverty, illiteracy, disease. And in 2013, the country is holding the same problems, but with two more, tribalism and corruption. Um, Bonifasi Mwangi, we're looking there at possibly the different perceptions. You talked a little bit about at the beginning of the programme at, at, at actually what sounded like a great disappointment at Kenya's potential not being met. Is that how you see it, even though the statistics in some areas look very good? You see, the growth of the economy does not mean that you're going to get jobs. So Kenya is a very capitalistic country where the wealth doesn't trickle down. So as much as they say that the economy is going to grow, the salaries still remain the same. We find that the majority of Kenyans survive on an average of less than $2 a day. So the growth does not trickle down. And because the government has not been deliberate about job creation, it's a guesswork. They don't create jobs. They make promises. The last president promised half a million jobs. He never gave us those jobs. The current president promised that he's going to employ young people and he's going to create employment. But right now he's retrenching people from the government. As we speak, we have the doctors on strike. People are dying in hospitals. As we speak, Moyale town has over 40,000 people have become refugees in Ethiopia. So you can't create jobs in a country where there's insecurity. Who is going to work? You can't create jobs in a, in a country where the government is actually focused on dealing with the ICC. What you have in power right now is an ICC management committee where the government has been in power for six months instead of focusing on job creation, instead of focusing on security because of terrorism and banditry, the government is focused on bashing the West, inviting Museveni to come and say ICC this, ICC West. So we have a country that is actually has one agenda and it's the ICC. And as they focus on the ICC, the country is suffering. As they focus on the ICC, young people are dying, being killed by police, dying in road accidents, committing suicide. So when I look as a young man in this country, I don't have hope unless the president agenda changes from the ICC to Kenyans who elected him. So for me, as a young person in this country, the future is bleak. As we borrow millions of dollars from the Chinese at a very higher rate, which means leaving my kids to pay back that loan. So as Kenya says that we're going to look at the East and we're going to look at the West, we look at the East and you get very expensive loans. You're getting money and you're not even jailing the people stealing the money from the public. The money that comes to this country is actually stolen. So unless the government tells us that they're going to deal with corruption, which is the other problem, and they deal with the catch of impunity and tribalism, then you're going to go forward. But how do we do that when the president was elected on ethnic lines? How do we do that 50 years later after independence, Kenya has no national values. We don't have values as a country. I was reading some of your writing and one of the, the quotes spoke, I think, volumes as to Kenya's economic position. In it, I'll just remind you of it. You said, I have learned that I, we are a dollar a day people, which is terrible, they say, because a cow in Japan is worth nine dollars a day. This means that a Japanese cow will be a middle class Kenyan. A nine dollar a day cow from Japan could very well head a humanitarian NGO in Kenya. Massages are very cheap in Nairobi, so the cow will be comfortable. Now, um, beautifully written and, and I suppose it raises a smile but it, it, it seems to be quite a serious point you're actually making 
Yes, you know, I think for me, I mean, the perpetual f frustration for me, I, I, I get, you know, traveling around Africa, you, you get Africans telling you, you know, you guys have, you've done certain things so well, you've been able to keep a sense of unitary self so well, uh, you have a framework of a possibly decent uh, uh, civil service, schooling system that's national, nationwide and so on and so forth. You know, I, I'm a child of, of people through Rwanda, I'm part Rwandese, part Ugandan, right, who saw their countries crack and fall. So, so th that simmering potentiality has always existed. It's always there. It's there. And of course, the frustration is always that the public, in terms of their ambitions, their labor, their creativity, their innovation, and quite often their manner of self-educating, quite often their manner of doing things, is always far, far ahead of the political change that we require. Um, and, and so you always kind of feel that you're on your own. Um, then you have a small moment where something good happens for like three weeks, and then you, you're, you're feeling that sinking feeling again. Um, uh, so for, for what, I'll, what I'll talk about is that, that it's not so much that the development ch challenges are huge. And I think that for us, uh, a country that has had a relative amount of peace for 50 years, we are doing much worse than we should have. And we had many, we had, we had several lost decades, we have many lost years, and part of it was a mixture of a lack, lack of fo focus and a terrible, terrible season of a certain kind of crude, almost animalistic competition between small elites... Uh, uh, or small-minded and small-thinking elites for very vague, senseless thefts of things. Like you're just saying, oh my goodness, if you'd spent like three more hours in your job that day, yeah, you'd have gotten the money you wanted <laughs> and even more, and we'd all kind of be doing better. But no, you know, people had to kind of go inside these strange pilfers. So the sense of, for, so this year, for example, the feeling of the members of parliament, you know, Boniface will know about this and the pigs in the blood and everything else, you're just like, oh my God, are we here for another season of gluttony and a certain kind of chaos and vague threat and again, a feeling of pigs, pigs stampeding in the mud and blood. So Mark, it sounds like um, you're really saying time, that those with I, the power are completely separate, diverse and away from the people that you're saying that represent those that could bring the country forward. Is that what, you, what you're telling us? What I'm saying is, yes, Yes, that is, that is the truth. What I say, though, I'll tell you that there is a structure upon which I think that the, the country itself has decided to fight and make itself. And that's the Constitution, right? Um, that Constitution came because, partly because we very nearly went to civil war, but because these things have been similar in our country for a long time. That Constitution, however much people seem to be fighting it, has regulated a departure from the norm so radical, our, our state has been reconstituted. So part of the chaos we see, you know, the confusion of our transition of government has, ma has a lot to do with the habits of the past and a lot has to do with the confusions of transition. We're in the habit of focusing in the center of a, at a presidential figure in a centralized state, an imperial president, right? And at this time you have 47 counties that have huge chunks of the budgets to deliver and visions to present and we're six months down the road. Um, so on one hand, you hear the wildly optimist dream, which I feel so much. One, you know, I bump around to people who are sending their kids from Nigeria to come to universities in Kenya, right? Because there's no, even just the private and the public university system are more functional and better than universities you'd see pretty much anywhere. Uh, the exports of my own cousins of people who want to come to high school, even state high school in Kenya, in pri pri private rates. You know, just going to jump in there. Just to sorry, give, sorry, to, sorry. That's okay, it's very interesting what you're saying, but I just want to ask Stephen how uh, we've touched a little bit about the the image of Kenya with the violence of 2007 and 8 during the elections there, the International Criminal Court looking at charges against the current president because of supposedly masterminding the violence there. How much of of that is doing d doing harm to the image of Kenya and stopping it from being seen in a different way from the rest of the world? Well, I think it depends what level one is looking at. If you're looking at global elites and opinion formers, then I think both that violence, fortunately not repeated in the last election, and ideas about corruption and mismanagement do a great deal of harm to Kenya and to a number of other newly independent states. 
If we're looking on more mass or popular level, whether in Britain or globally, then most people, frankly, don't take much notice of these things. The degree of coverage, the degree of awareness of Kenya's or other post-imperial states problems in Britain on popular level is very limited indeed. So far as most people in Britain have any ideas about Kenya, they're probably either about wild animals and safaris or their historical images uh, from the 1950s, the so-called Mau Mau Revolt, the end of empire, or of course their even older historical media and fictional images centered on the lives and the complicated love lives of a tiny minority of privileged white settlers in colonial Kenya. Um, so Bonne most Bonne people on a mass level just don't know what goes on in Kenya now. Boniface Mwangi, you, you took lots of photographs of the violence in 2007 and 8 that have been well respected and well received. I'm just thinking about how you think that, that the violence at the time had an impact on Kenya in the greater world and also about how you think that that really speaks volumes as to how they see the people that are in power in Kenya. You know, the sad part is that uh, a democratic country, we went to the vote and we decided to elect people who have been accused of crimes against humanity. But it's the way the culture in this country is that if you commit crimes, like at the moment as I speak, uh, we have drug barons and people accused of murder and people accused of rape in power. And so it makes this country look that we're 50 year old, but we're like a 50 year old baby who can't make the right decisions. Because how does a, a sane country, how do millions of Kenyans go and queue and elect someone accused for crimes against humanity to become the president. Normally as a father, I can't, I, I can't employ anyone accused of rape to come and work as my houseboy, even if it's alleged rape. Because the moment it's alleged, that means something happened and that's why they arrested you. So in the, maybe for countries that actually respect the rule of law and justice, then we look like a pariah state. But for countries that are the neighboring countries like Uganda and Rwanda, because we, we like we, in a, we, this continent, this part of the East, in East Africa, we're the big brother. We claim to have the biggest economy and claim to be like, we know everything. So in our region, we, they, look, they look up to us. So in our region, we are respected. But beyond the region, I think, it doesn't make sense for what we did on March 4th. But beyond that, you have to realize that this country works for the elite. As Binyabanga was saying, oh, we have good schools, we have good hospitals and all that. Because if you have money in this country, you can enjoy the best of life. So this kind of functions for anyone who is elite. But if you're not elite, it doesn't work for you. I've That's got, it. I've got so one yes, more, things are functioning. One very right speak, brief last, yeah? last question. One very brief Go question. Ahead. How do you think Kenyans see Britain and the British nowadays? I think it's propaganda. I think Kenyans have no beef with the British government. Uh, what we have beef with is our government and our leadership because we can't blame the British for our problems. The British haven't been running this country for the last 50 years. So let, let us not lie to ourselves that we can blame the West for our issues. The West don't run this country. The West don't vie for seats in this country. It's our leaders, it's our own black people, black skin, who should blame for our problems. So, the majority of Kenyans actually don't see the West as a problem, but because of the way our government has a very well propaganda machine, then it looks like the West is a problem, or the British. But we don't view, we don't have any grudge with the British. As a young man who grew up in post-colonial Kenya, I have no beef with the British government, and actually I have friends who are white, British, American, whatever color they are, it doesn't matter. So uh, at the moment, our issue is black on black. Our issue is actually we have a black president who is like one of us, but inside he has the habits of the old colonial government of grabbing, stealing, looting, and the culture of tribalism, because the tribalism in this country didn't start with the Jomo Kenyatta, it started with actually the British. Then the guys who took over, the Kenyatta, the Kibaki, the Moai, and now Uhuru, they mastered the act of tribalism. And so my biggest beef and the Kenya's biggest beef is not with the British, to the Kenyan government. That's good to hear. I'd like to now thank all three of my guests for joining me. Ben Yavanga Wenaina, speaking to us from Nairobi. Stephen Howe from Oxford in the UK. And Boniface Mwangi, also from Nairobi. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your thoughts uh, on this very interesting issue. Thank you. A reminder, you can find this programme and many more at facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story. And why not like us while you're there? I'm Sue Turton. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.